Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, uh, today. These are very interesting times um, in the Middle East, to say the least. Um, I'm Joyce Karam. I'll be your moderator. I'm the Washington correspondent for uh, The National. Uh, and we will be discussing uh, a very interesting event that happened 10 days ago uh, in, in Iraq. I see many familiar uh, faces here who probably uh, follow this as close as uh, we do. Uh, this was the fourth election uh, since uh, the toppling of uh, the Saddam uh, uh, Hussein uh, regime. I don't think we should be measuring it exactly with the Western standards that, that we follow and looking at other uh, elections. Uh, there has been a lot of irregularities. There has been uh, intimidation uh, reported. And there are few challenges that could take a few months to, to resolve. We didn't get the official results till uh, seven days after, after uh, the vote. But the most fascinating uh, outcome of this is the, the victory of uh, the Shia cleric uh, Muqtada uh, Sadr, who has 16% uh, of, uh, of the seats in, in the parliament, 54 uh, seats. Since his win, he's been very active on Twitter. He's even using emojis. Um, he's been very poetic in his tweets. He's met, uh, he's met who he needs to meet uh, to move ahead with, with a coalition, uh, whether uh, people he ran with in, in, in the uh, running for the election or uh, what would look like to be his opposition. Uh, I don't know who's here very familiar with Mr. Sadr, but um, he's a character. I don't know. He's been, if you've watched uh, shows like Boardwalk uh, Empire or even The Godfather, I mean, he could very well be on one of, uh, of these shows. If you haven't, I, I highly recommend Boardwalk. He's not Michael. He's more like Fredo, but yes. Uh, Nucky Thompson or Rosenstein type, but yes. Um, Anyway, so he's been called an outlaw by Paul Bremer. He's been called immature by others. But he's a survivor, and he's uh, a persona that could reshape Iraqi politics and regional politics today, depending on how uh, the coalition talks and uh, the consultations to form the government uh, go. Uh, with me to discuss all of this is a great panel, uh, some friends uh, that I'm really delighted to, to be talking to them. We're going to have this as a free flow. We're going to be interrupting. We might be taking questions from you on and off. And uh, we'll be just trying to make this as dynamic as possible to really understand what's happening inside uh, Iraq. Uh, I'm going to just introduce everyone uh, quickly to the, to the far uh, left. Ironically, is uh, <laughs> is Mike Pregent, who is now a senior fellow at um, at the Hudson Institute. Uh, Mike uh, has followed Iraq extensively. He served uh, in Iraq, uh, and he uh, will be uh, presenting a scene setter for for the election. Who won? Who stands where today? Uh, next to him is uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, who is a former ambassador, uh, U.S. ambassador to both Iraq and uh, Turkey. I remember interviewing Ambassador Jeffrey uh, maybe around 2008, and I asked you, where is uh, Muqtada now? And you said, how would I know? He's one of the most ambiguous uh, personas for the U.S. to track politically and physically in, in uh, Iraq. Uh, next to him is Ahmed uh, Majidiar from the uh, Middle East Institute. Uh, Ahmed uh, runs the Iran Observe Project. I highly recommend that you sign up uh, for that. And he will be talking more about the Ir Iran's role in Iraq and what's at stake with Muqtada's rise. Uh, and right next to him is Bilal Wahab uh, from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He follows very closely the Kurdish uh, uh, scene in, Ira in Iraq, which, which has its own complexities today and will help us 
uh, understand this better. So with that, why don't we go to Mike? Uh, <coughs> sure, thank you. Yep. We're also going to make this a series. Uh, all the panelists are going <coughs> to do this again in late June and also late July to see what we got right, what we got wrong. Because again, these government formations take a while. In 2010, it took 10 months. And in 2014, it took four months. So again, just because this coalition looks a certain way now doesn't mean he'll look anything like this in 90 days. So the title of this, this panel, and of course I like to get up and show you guys slides, is Waiting for Sadr and Soleimani. I already have the NDA on this, so you can't use this. This will be on Broadway in about six months. <laughs> but again, this is the current, current party setup here with the elections. This is actually forming. This is the Sadr, Hikma, Nasser uh, coalition that's starting to form, based on what Joyce has said. Um, Sadr is meeting with everybody he's supposed to meet with. He met with Waili. He's met with Hadi al Amri. He's met with Abadi. He's met with Omar Hakim. Hakim was the first person to, to meet with uh, Sadr, actually. This is a coalition. I actually spoke to a representative of the Hikma party this morning, and he said the goal here is to form government without Maliki's state of law and, to, and, and Fatah. And, but he caveated Fatah by saying, we're okay bringing Hadi al Amri in, we're just not okay bringing Kais Ghazali in. So that's, that's key there. But what, is that, what happens if, if that happens? And I have a slide that will show that. This is what Qasem Soleimani wants. The reason I mentioned Qasem Soleimani is he was influential in Iraq's 2010 mm -hmm. elections and Iraq's 2014 elections. In 2010, we, uh, I worked on a uh, group called Checkmate for General Odierno, and we basically, the only way Maliki could actually be prime minister is if we red teamed Maliki into this position, meaning Maliki would take advantage of the accountability and justice law, the terrorism law, tribal support council funds, and, and all these things in order to form a coalition. He also cited the threat of Al Qaeda and used martial law in order to build a coalition that, 10 months later, became Maliki in charge of Iraq when nobody saw that coming after, after uh, Alawi had actually won the right to form government. And Sadr supported uh, Maliki then, right? He did after stating he didn't. So Sadr came out and said he would not support Maliki, and in the end, Sadr supported Maliki. Sadr said the same thing in 2014, and in the end, supported Maliki. <laughs> Sadr has said he will not form any, govern any government coalition with Amri or Maliki. He's already met with Amri, mm -hmm. and I'm waiting for the, the over-under on him meeting with Maliki is seven to 10 days. Uh, so I'm looking for that. Um, again, I am a skeptic on Sadr, the rebranding of Sadr, because I've seen Sadr be moved when Sadr's needed to be moved. And Qasem Soleimani's great at that. Now, in a post-JCPOA world, where Qasem Soleimani should have less influence, we have to remember that in 2010, when Soleimani did that, that was the height of the US sanctions on Iran, with the Europeans and the Russians and the Chinese all on board, sanctioning Iran to the point where they were, they were hurting. They're hurting again, but I don't think that necessarily means that Qasem Soleimani still doesn't have influence. Again, this is what he wants to do. To do that, he has to move the Hikma party over. He has to move Nasser, which is Abadi's party, over. Again, uh, Sadr's party can be fractured. It has communists in it. It has, has different people in this list. Abadi's can be fractured as well. The narrative in the Washington Post is that Abadi won Nineveh province. He didn't win Nineveh province. Obeidi won Nineveh province. Obeidi just happened to be part of of uh, Abadi's uh, Nasser alliance. So this is the goal. You can form government here, 182 seats without Maliki or the IRGC Quds Force backed Fatah party. This is what we want. This is the best case scenario. We want these two groups marginalized in Iraq. There's still some problems here. Who is Sadr? Is he gonna be the guy that everyone hopes he's gonna be or is he gonna fall back into that role where he can be pushed around again? Sadr didn't run for a political position. He just put a list together. He can't be prime minister. He's not going to be anything like that. He just has a party. And in the end, you know, real quick, I would say, in 2016, Sadr was part of a, a kidnapping operation against three Americans. He ransomed them back to the U.S. after they were abused, uh, after they were beaten, and they were threatened with sexual abuse. He ransomed them back to the U.S., three Americans. That's 2016. In 2017, he said if President Trump moved the American embassy to Jerusalem, that he would uh, call for a, 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 a Shia Sunni awakening to take back Jerusalem. He also called for the immediate shutdown of the US embassy. This was in 2017. So when we talk about Sadr 
being this great hope for Iraq. Let's remember who he is. I'm happy to be wrong. I am movable, but I will have to see concrete steps. I will have to see facts. This is the big issue. If the best case scenario happens and these two parties are left out of government, that's what this looks like. Fatah Party is all of these militias. Fatah Party is Kitab Hezbollah, Asab Ahul Haq, the Badr Corps, um, you know, Saraya Kursani, Harakat Nujeba, and what's, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Kitab Imamali. That's the Fatah Party. If they're not part of the government coalition and government forms without them, you literally have a party that was legitimized in this election. They came in second. Again, it was Sadr, <clears throat> then it was this party, the Fatah party, that came in second, then a body. So you would have a legitimate political party outside of government that has a state sponsor, that state sponsor being Iran, that has a militia presence on the ground in places where they are, they have primacy. They are also now in the Iraqi security forces, both in the Ministry of Interior and Ministry of Defense. So this would be an opposition party, an opposition party that would be at odds with this government formation. Now, if it's an inclusive government where they come in, we still have a problem because now there would be legitimate forces in the MOD and MOI. The other scenario uh, presupposes that they would be exited under a DDR process and pushed out where we see test the capabilities of the Iraqi security forces, the CTS, the counterterrorism services, to actually go after IRGC Quds Force militias. And we've had people from Badr come here and talk to us and say, listen, support Hadi al and we'll help you with Kitab Hezbollah and AH. That schism is what we're looking for. But again, if there is this all-inclusive government where they're able to come in, you're looking at ending the US training and equip program in the Ministry of Interior, possibly the Ministry of Defense. You're looking at the possibility, and some of my panelists uh, disagree, of US secondary sanctions on any ministry that Fatah controlled. And they're not looking to control MOI and MOD. They're looking to control finance, transportation, and oil, because those are the places where the IRGC is already playing in Iraq's economic sectors, a place that Iran wants to offset US sanctions post JCPOA by making Iraq a shell company, so to speak, for the regime. So with that, I'll end. I'll go back to here, because other panelists want to use this slide, and we can flip back and forth. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, Ambassador Jeffrey, I'm going to go to you, since sure. uh, I think many of us are having flashbacks from 2010. Uh, you've uh, watched that election very closely. We've seen, you know, Qasem Soleimani was in Iraq. Brett McGurk was also in Iraq. They're back in Iraq uh, today. But back then, it seemed that uh, Soleimani was much faster than uh, the US and was able to pull off what he saw as a winning coalition. Uh, how is today different? And uh, mm -hmm. do you expect a different outcome? Um, well, Qasem Soleimani wasn't that quick because uh, it took everybody nine months to put together a coalition. Uh, a couple of general comments about why it's different today. First of all, uh, any Washington audience doesn't need to be told why Iraq is important, but audiences everywhere else in America do need to. Iraq is important, but we have to make the point, and the point is that uh, uh, it is uh, essential to uh, any realistic effort to stop Iran in the region, and for a variety of reasons, that can be pitched to the American uh, public in a way that many other issues in the Middle East cannot be. Secondly, Iraq on a good day could produce, with current capacity, five million barrels a day. That's half of uh, what Saudi Arabia produces. That has a huge impact on oil prices uh, around the world and gasoline prices at the pump here. So those are several reasons why Iraq is important beyond the effort that the United States has put into it. Uh, I've been involved, besides 2010, in three other uh, government formations, uh, three of the four on the ground in Iraq. And uh, this is a drug we cannot escape and probably shouldn't escape. But this is a drug that doesn't do us a whole lot of good, because our ability to control any of this 
is very, very limited. Our ability to even understand a whole lot of this is very, very limited. And one of the problems is we're dealing in uh, the Iranians with uh, people who also have their problems understanding it, but they're better than we are at it for many reasons, one of which is proximity, cultural similarity. They know the languages in many cases uh, and are able to travel in large numbers freely around the country. Uh, but the uh, difference today is that uh, there is no possible uh, pro-American coalition that will win in Iraq. As Michael uh, pointed out the numbers, but I just want to put more of a uh, sharp tone on it. Uh, there is no solution, and we had to twist ourselves like a pretzel to come up with solutions in 2010, but they were at least theoretically possible. But there is none in um, Iraq. Uh, three coalitions headed by people who are uh, generally opposed to us, Muqtadar al-Sada, uh, Hadi al-Amri, and Maliki, have 120 plus votes. More importantly, they have the vast majority of Shia votes. The first rule that was uh, brutally made clear to me in Iraq in 2010 is that a Shia prime minister is the fate of the country. Now, we can rail against that, point out what such uh, unofficial uh, allocation of sectarian positions does to a country. Uh, look at Lebanon, but that's the reality of it. So. Uh, it's going to have to come from uh, one of those three groups. Uh, Abadi and Hakim, between them, do not have really uh, enough votes to, on their own, without one of those three, uh, make a difference and convince people it'll be a stable government. On the other hand, if you throw, as you did in your chart, Muqtadar uh, party with 50, 54 <coughs> votes, yes. uh, 54 uh, seats in the parliament, uh, into this uh, broad uh, anybody but the pro-Iranians coalition, uh, you come up with a very solid uh, majority. I suspect that that will be what the U.S. will push for mm. uh, because the U.S. goal is almost certainly, to the extent we can ascertain what goals are in Washington today, um, uh, to keep the Iranians uh, out of power. That will be challenged by some in the administration who basically will want a pro-American government and uh, do not listen to arguments that will uh, weigh in against that because they just believe, like the tooth fairy, that uh, the populations always are like us and want to be like us, and if you find <laughs> the magic formula and promise American investment and other things, uh, you always get the solution you want. Well, we've got a solution like that nowhere in the last uh, 70 years other than 1989 in uh, East Europe and Colombia, and that's not much of a basis to build a policy on. So I suspect Washington will go with that. Uh, my... Sadr Abadi, just to be clear, is Sadr Abadi... Uh, right, and possibly, while the U.S. would be much biased towards Abadi, particularly the military, uh, that may not also be attainable for various reasons that we're picking up that others here will talk about. Finally, on the uh, uh, Iranian side, again, we have an expert here, but it looks like their goal will be to push for a, at least if I were them, I would push for not a competing coalition because they just don't have the numbers, but rather a, um, a grand uh, uh, all-party coalition, which is what we had in the end in 2010, but that uh, enabled the Iranians and pro-Iranians to take key spots. So I'll stop there with my dire prediction about how the Iranians are going to uh, uh, block whatever we're all trying to do. Yeah, so, so, Ahmed, what would it mean for, uh, let's say, Iranian blocs to be in the opposition if that, if that turns out to, to be the case? And on the ground, what, does, what leverage does Iran use to, to, to bring people to, to its coalition? Is it uh, just political? Is it financial? Uh, because they did get Sunni support in, in 2010 as well. So if you can explain that to us. Uh, sure. Uh, when it comes to Iraq, uh, Iran doesn't play the Russian roulette. Uh, for those who have uh, not been to casino, um, Iran tends to play more the uh, uh, roulette wheel, that putting chips on different numbers so that its influence just permeates different groups and different segments of society and uh, Iraqi uh, political establishment. Um, so, although the 
election result was not the optimal results that Iran wanted. Uh, Iran's preferred uh, coalition was the Fatah coalition, uh, the uh, alliance of uh, popular mobilization forces uh, that have very close ties with Tehran and have been fighting both in Iraq and Syria um, with the Quds Force. Uh, and although the Fatah alliance came second, uh, Iran doesn't see that as a loss, um, contrary to the conventional wisdom that we see here, because uh, those groups within the Fatah alliance uh, still they won, uh, their, uh, their, the number of their seats in the parliament increased by fivefold compared to the 2014 election. So whether they are uh, in the opposition or uh, they are inside the government, they will ho exert a lot of influence uh, in the Iraqi politics. Um, and right now, Iran wants to just consolidate its gains, both similar to in Syria, also in Iraq. That those popular mobilization forces, uh, they have made significant military gains in Iraq uh, uh, against ISIS. They want to translate those uh, military gains into, a, um, into uh, political achievements. Um, so I, I, I do agree with uh, the ambassador that uh, Iran wants a kind of a national unity government, as the ambassador suggested. Because uh, in comparison to 2010, actually, the situation for Iraq is more delicate. Because they have a very serious concerns about Sadr. Uh, they think that Sadr would uh, try to marginalize the PMF groups. Uh, Sadr could uh, uh, try to disband the PMF or integrate it into uh, the Iraqi security forces, something Iran doesn't want because Iran wants the PMF to remain a separate entity uh, uh, parallel to the Iraqi security forces. Uh, and also Sadr could uh, open uh, Iraq to the uh, Iran's regional rivals, particularly Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and their um, Whom he visited. Allies. Um, yeah, yeah, yes. indeed. That la last, last year, uh, Sadr visited Riyadh and also went to UAE as well. Uh, so they are concerned about that. Uh, but they do not necessarily want to isolate Sadr in any potential government. Because as Ambassador mentioned, they don't have that kind of numbers. So even if Iran want, uh, is able to uh, put a, an, an alliance of uh, Fatah with uh, potentially with uh, uh, Prime Minister Abadi or others, uh, it would be difficult to sustain that government. And, uh, and Sadr is not Alawi in 2010, because he has the ability to mobilize the masses. He can just topple the government and just make life very much difficult for that government. So a broad coalition that uh, can secure Iran's core objectives uh, in Iraq would be acceptable. What are the core objectives? The core objectives, first of all, it, uh, that that there should be a Shiite-dominated, uh, friendly government in Baghdad, and, and also a uh, government and parliament uh, that would set a timetable for the withdrawal of US forces. Uh, remember that when Prime Minister Abadi twice visited last year, Tehran, and in each meeting with Khamenei, Khamenei had two requests from Abadi. One, that don't disband the PMF or even integrate it completely into security forces. And the second request was, that to uh, set a chart, uh, timetable for the US withdrawal. Um, third, it is also that Iran doesn't want uh, Saudi Arabia and others to increase its influence, not just in the Sunni communities, but also throw Sadr in the Shiite heartlands of Karbala and Najaf. Uh, because they think that that would bring more, uh, uh, empower the uh, Shiite nationalists, with, which would be uh, harmful for the Iranian interest. And fourth, it's also about uh, uh, strengthening the uh, PMF groups, uh, those PMF groups who have close ties with Iran, both, uh, both as uh, military forces and also into the Iraqi security forces. Um, and also, of course, Iran, Iran sees Iraq as, uh, as part of its uh, so-called, in their own words, uh, axis of resistance to project power and also use those groups, uh, similar to Hezbollah, uh, for its uh, regional interest. Um, and now that tension between Tehran and Washington is increasing, uh, Iran, of course, sees its uh, neighbor, Iraq, as kind of a strategic debt. Uh, so it doesn't want to lose uh, Iraq at all costs. Uh, but having said that, I think it's also important not to overstate the uh, Iranian uh, influence over the Iraqi Shiites, because the Iraqi Shiites, uh, they're very diverse uh, as 
somehow it, it manifested itself in the elections. Uh, and there are very few people in Iraq, uh, in the Shias, that accept the Vilayat al Faqiyah version of Iran. Uh, so even for the Trump administration, if it is serious, for example, about the pushback strategy uh, in, uh, in the region, that I think that Iraq will play a very central part. We'll go more to that, and I will be asking Mike if the U.S. should engage uh, Sadr or not. But uh, Bilal, uh, the Kurdish arena today, uh, how critical it is in, in being the kingmaker in any of these uh, coalitions. We're, we're talking about maybe 45 votes mm. uh, if you merge the, the Kurdish uh, uh, you know, uh, blocks today in, in the parliament. Where do they stand? How do you see them uh, aligning themselves in, in any <coughs> coalition uh, forming? Um, thank you, and thanks, Mike. Uh, if this were only a game of numbers, then yes, the Kurds could probably be kingmakers again, because yep. they do actually have the numbers. If you look at all of the Kurdish uh, members of parliament, you're looking at around 64. Who, uh, who are we looking so, at? So, so KDP, PUK, and then, of course, the opposition, um, uh, outside the sort of duopoly in the KRG. And the, actually, this time around, the uh, Kurds have members in Baghdad and, and, and outside the, uh, the KRG. Uh, but this is not a game of numbers, because uh, like the Shia house is divided, like the Sunni house is divided, this time around, uh, the Kurdish house is also uh, very deeply uh, divided. Um, yes, the KDP uh, has gained uh, 25 seats in the Iraqi parliament. Barazani. And this is uh, led by Masoud Barzani, uh, former KRG president. And actually, as a political party, that will be the largest bloc in the Iraqi uh, parliament. So it's a question of translating these numbers into power. Because while the Kurds have the numbers, the unity at home that has been the main point of strength uh, uh, for Kurdish role in Baghdad has really taken serious blows. It started mainly last year with the uh, uh, referendum that took place in September. Uh, some uh, Kurdish parties were opposed to it. Uh, when the referendum passed, and then uh, we know that in October, the Iraqi uh, government um, used the military to take back some of those uh, territories that were under Kurdish control since 2014, mainly. That's mainly the town of Kirkuk. Um, so you have, and then of course, added to that, uh, uh, today, for example, Brett McGurk, uh, the U.S. envoy to the fight against ISIS, met with four main opposition parties who accused the KDP of, and PUK of rigging the elections. Mm. So while the Kurds have an opportunity of being kingmakers, you have an opposition that blames the two main parties in the KRG, the PUK and the KDP, of losing, uh, of, of doing a referendum that the international community, including the United States, advised very strongly against and then losing half of the territory that the Kurds controlled, and then stealing an election. So it's very difficult to put this broken house uh, together, despite the uh, opportunity, the great opportunity that Baghdad uh, presents. But nonetheless, uh, since the KDP has done so well, it has the opportunity of, of speaking on behalf of the Kurds, and going to Baghdad and negotiating on behalf of the, the KRG, even if it does not represent all of the KRG. And this is, in itself, is interesting and worth uh, watching because on the one hand, it was the KDP and, and Mr. Barzani who led the independence referendum. So this is uh, kind of a 180 degree uh, turn that uh, the first delegation to go to Baghdad and start re-engaging with Baghdad and reinvesting in Iraqi institutions is, is the KDP. So that is, uh, is definitely a step in the, in the direction that helps uh, and serves U.S. interests. Uh, but there are also dire needs in the KRG. The referendum and the aftermath of the referendum brought home some harsh realities to the Kurds that you know, they don't have that, the kind of friends that will stand with you no matter the kind of mistakes that you make. Um, that's why the KRG are now looking for a new patron. They're looking at Russia. And one of the first things that they did after the referendum and the, the retake of Iraqi forces of Kirkuk, uh, they went to Tehran and they kissed and made up because they realized that uh, the the uh, you know adversaries that are closer to you are still able to hurt you, and your faraway friends may not always come to your uh, to your aid. So they're trying to make new faraway friends like Russia with with some oil and gas deals, and then make sure that they make up with uh, uh, with adversaries like uh, uh, like Iran. 
In this uh, calculation, however, in this game of patrons, so to speak, Turkey is missing because they're too busy with their internal uh, domestic politics, but Turkey is still a key actor, not least by still allowing the KRG to export about 250,000 barrels of oil a day. So the Kurdish interest in re-engaging Baghdad, uh, you know, there are still important issues now that the referendum is, is behind us. And that's mainly the question of uh, you know, how much Baghdad respects the constitution mm -hmm. that really enshrines some serious rights for the Kurds and for the KRG. Uh, the question of the economy, of oil, of budget sharing. Uh, the question of disputed territories, Kirkuk most importantly, because despite the shifting balance of power as a constitutional issue, as a, as a reconciliation issue, uh, Kirkuk is still an issue that's not resolved whether it belongs to the KRG, to the Iraqi government, or whether it remains independent. And then, of course, uh, this is Iraq, and politics in Iraq works through establishing patronage network. And you know, there is no free market. There's no, the only way that these parties uh, can, can create jobs for their, uh, it's, it's through cronyism. You get uh, to the government, you get a position, you get a ministry, then you use that ministry to dole out not only jobs to your supporters and loyalists, but also the companies that your, uh, you know, your party owns or, or, or you know, shadow companies that you own. And this is true throughout Iraq. So being outside the party, the government being this, this sort of you know, money-making party, is very difficult. So uh, back to the scenarios that uh, Mike put on the chart, it's very difficult for, uh, for Iraq to have major political actors that are in opposition. Because what that means is that they will not have access to the cake. They will not have access to the dough, so to speak. Uh, because there isn't much outside of the, the government and the government-controlled economy by way of making money and therefore maintaining support for another four years to be back in government. It's no surprise that the parties that have been in government since 2003 still maintain uh, leverage and power despite corruption, government, governance failure, uh, et cetera. So that is where we're headed. We occurs basically to, to in, a, in a nutshell, they have opportunities vis-a-vis -vis Baghdad, but the troubles inside KRG are so major that uh, many actors are willing to, to basically play spoiler and therefore lose this opportunity that uh, this election presents. But are they more likely to join Abadi Sadr, or is this you know, maybe payback time and, and just break with, uh, with Abadi? That's actually a very interesting question. Um, with, with regard to positions in Baghdad, um, there is a debate within the Kurdish uh, polity whether the Kurds should go for the position of president. Since 2003, Iraq has always had a Kurdish president. Uh, so should the Kurds ask for that position again or, or in Baghdad, or should they go for uh, the Speaker of Parliament, given you know, these questions of budget and oil law, et cetera? Um, however, let's not forget that it's personalities that make policies. And there is a simmering anger inside uh, the KRG, uh, maybe specifically with the KDP, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Prime Minister Maliki and Prime Minister Abadi. Uh, uh, Maliki uh, created the Dijla force that, was, that, that came you know, close to a military um, a conflict with the KRG in 2014. And then, of course, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abadi is the one who rolled in the tanks on, on, on Kirkuk on the Kurdish Peshmerga, and at some point there were also clashes between the, the Peshmerga and the, uh, and the Iraqi security forces. So there is a simmering anger. Sometimes Iraqi politics is not, is not about what I want, it's about blocking what the other person wants. You know, there's a Nasiriya joke about that for the Iraqis in the audience, right? So it's always about being a spoiler, right? It's not, uh, so there's an element of that as well. Uh, so the Kurds would welcome, probably, a non dawa party uh, prime minister. And the only way to do this is, instead of to say we don't want Maliki or we don't want Abadi, is for, it's easier for the Kurds to say we want Dawa party not to have a monopoly over the position of the premiership. Something that resonates with Hikmah uh, and, and Sadr. OK, interesting. Um, Mike, should the US be, be engaging uh, Sadr? I mean, he's been you know, equal opportunity troller on, on Twitter. Right. He's tweeting at everyone, wants an inclusive uh, government, he hasn't uh, really bashed the U.S. Since, since he won. He criticized the decision on Jerusalem, but he's been very careful. Populist, nationalist narrative. What should the U.S. do? Should McGurk, who is in Iraq, meet with him? If I was Sauter, I would say you'd probably want somebody of higher status to, to meet with you. Uh, 
from our U.S. government at this point. We, we were never able to meet with Sadr. We tried to meet with Sadr the whole time we were in Iraq. His whole brand was based on not meeting with the U.S. By not meeting with the U.S., you were not recognizing that the U.S. was a legitimate player in Iraq. Uh, Sadr's brand is built on not sitting down with an American. Again, when he went to, to Riyadh, we have to remember that Iran cut off Sadr, cut him off financially. We have to remember that when Qasem Soleimani saw talent in the Sadr's movement, he pulled it out of the Sadr's movement. He pulled out Kais Ghazali, he pulled out Laith Ghazali, he pulled out Akram al Kabi, he pulled out Haji Shibbal. When he sees talent in Sadr's camp, he pulls it out and forms a new militia. Mm. In Kitab Imam Ali, Harakat Nujeba, these are, these are militias that created uh, since 2015 to marginalize the Sadr's movement. Remember, the Charge of the Knights campaign in 2008 was to marginalize Sadr. Prior to this election, there was also a, a disarming campaign in Basra, again, targeted on disarming Sadr's uh, Saraya as salam his militia. The only skirmish between a Hashid al-Shabi type force and the Iraqi security forces was Sadrists mm -hmm. against uh, a body security detail north of Baghdad, south of Hawija. Sadr surprised he won. There, Sadr did not think he was going to win. Remember, when he, when he stormed the IZ in 2016-17, he said he wanted to change the election uh, format because he didn't think he was going to be able to do well. With 45% turnout, this is what you get. Sadr was always able to mobilize 3 million votes. Uh, he only got, uh, what, 438,000 out of this election, out of that 3 million? Let's, let's, be, let's be nice and say 1.5 million. So he got 50% of his total capacity. I'm so, I think he's surprised he, he won, to be honest with you. I think he's, he's hedging his bets. Again, he's meeting with everybody. But his brand, when we saw Sadrist uh, uh, cheering in Sadr City in Basra, there were two chants. The United States is out, and Iran is out. Um, Iran's not going anywhere in, in Iraq. The US, even the moderate Shia political parties are asking for the US to exit. So. I think the best thing that, that Sadr can do for his brand, for us, is meet with us, because it'll, it'll water him down. It'll actually make him look weak if he meets with the United States. Even on a high level, let's say? It has to be higher than Brett McGurk. It needs to be a vice president. It needs to be a vice president. It needs to be somebody senior. It needs to be Pompeo. It cannot be Brett McGurk. Brett McGurk is, you know, I, I may be the lone holdout here on the panel, but I think uh, Sadr's probably the only person that hasn't been disappointed by Brett McGurk yet in Iraq. And I think, uh, you know, again, you know, not, not it needs to be somebody higher for, for his status. I mean, he is, he is going to be the kingmaker here, right? Or at least right now, he looks like the kingmaker. Yeah. Um, if he meets with the U.S., that would be great. It needs to be a vice president or secretary of state Pompeo, and that would actually hurt him and help Soleimani, because Soleimani would be able to say, you're anti-U.S., patron is no longer anti-U.S. He's now not only a puppet of Mohammed bin Salman, he's now a puppet of the United States. And that hurts the brand. And again, when, you, when, you, when he went to Riyadh, it's because he was cut off. So he went to Riyadh for a, for a paycheck. And when he went to CMBS, that money comes without conditions. Again, Abadi said it the best. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia can paint the desert green in Anbar, as long as they don't uh, affect any of our uh, strategies. Again, we've seen the Saudis do this in Syria and Lebanon, pour a lot of money in, only to have it fall to Iranian influence, meaning the IRGC can do whatever it wants in Syria, can do whatever it wants in, well, less so in Syria now that Russia is sitting on its hands. That's a different story. But in Lebanon, based on our conversations early with the ambassador, Lebanon has now fallen into the Iranian sphere of influence, even though all that Saudi money has gone in. It needs to be conditional. When Soleimani, we were talking about how does Soleimani pressure these groups to do things, it's not an ask. It's an ask, then it's a threat, then it's a buy-off, then it's leverage, then it's uh, triangulation. It's all of these things that Soleimani is going to do. Yeah. yeah, all these Money, things. cash bags going to, to tribes, going to... Well, that's what Maliki did in 2010. He used uh, American money through the tribal support councils to buy those Shia nationalists that were hoping push back against Iran to pay them off. Again... The, the Shia nationalists, the anti-Iran Shia of Iraq, are like American electorates ahead of an election. Promises made to get the votes, 
Once it happens, no attention is paid to those, to those demographics. And that is what has happened in Iraq with, with the Shia nationalists in Iraq, especially the Marsh, the Shia, the Mar the Shia tribes of the Marsh areas of southern Iraq. Um, there are a lot of things we can do, and, and they're, they're not, they pale in comparison to what Qasem Soleimani will do. Yeah, I, I would like to um, uh, offer a couple, uh, to some degree a contrarian position, um, and this requires me to some degree to support Muqtada, not support Muqtada al-Sadr, but to put him in another light. Uh, it is very difficult to distinguish between genuine political movements and crowds that are purchased by bribes and money and temporary things. Um, the KDP and the PUK, despite collectively having uh, destroyed or nearly destroyed the KRG a year ago, uh, are real political parties uh, with a lot of corruption. Um, there is a huge difference between Hezbollah and even the most cohesive of the Iranian militia, pro-Iranian militias in uh, Iraq, and that would be the Bada Corps. And that is, Hezbollah is a true, full-service, uh, uh, governing entity anchored in the Shia of southern Lebanon. Uh, there's nothing quite like that other than the Kurds in Iraq. But the closest you come to a movement uh, at least, uh, certainly apart from the um, Kurds, is the Sadrus movement. And this goes back, it has not all that much to do with Muqtad al-Sadr, it has everything to do with his father. Mm -hmm. And his father's extraordinary role as an almost revolutionary figure in uh, Iraqi Islam, Shia Islam, and the role of the al-Sadr family throughout the region, uh, all the way to Libya, where one of his cousins... Uh, what was uh, Imam Musa uh, was actually killed. Uh, this is a very powerful force in Shia Islam. And uh, you combine that with the uh, Hausa and Najaf, and you have two competing uh, uh, sources of balance in Iraq that Iran has not been able to uh, shove aside. Mm -hmm. The problem is neither will deal with us. Uh, they have their own views, the Hausa, that is uh, Sistani, and uh, the, the Sadrus movement, uh, Muqtada. Uh, they have the, their views on us, which vary over time, but it never will be an open embrace. It will never be an open acknowledgement of a pro-American course of action. So essentially, that's not an option for the United States in uh, Iraq at this point. Whether that will be recognized by Washington, particularly this Washington, or particularly this administration, I'm not sure, because uh, there'll always be people who uh, know Iraq as well as I who will say, no, there's this way you can uh, slice the uh, a loaf, there's that way you can slice the loaf. And uh, it, just, it is very difficult to do this because the people we are slicing the loaf with when we limit it to those who are pro-American very quickly gets to the KDP to the extent, Bilal, that the KDP still uh, trusts the United States because, as you pointed out, Michael, uh, they were very disappointed. They shouldn't have been disappointed. We have more right to be disappointed in them than they have to us. But the, at the end of the day, it's what they think that counts, not what we think. So we don't have a whole lot of uh, uh, genuine uh, bottom-up uh, political juice in Iraq. Iran doesn't have as much as it would like. It has nothing like Hezbollah, again. But it has a much better ability to manipulate the manipul manipulatable political parties, who are most of the political parties in Iraq, which gets you to a government, which gets you to government decisions that either affect our security, Iran's security, and the security of the neighbors in ways, good or bad, that are of great concern to everybody. But Ambassador, I, yeah, one thing one, one, yeah, moderator, I guess. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you shut my mic off. It's not working anymore. What's going on? <laughs> so basically, you mentioned the, the cult of personality also around around Sadr, given that his father was assassinated by uh, Saddam. Uh, he's the great nephew of um, uh, Imam Musa Sadr, uh, vanished in, in, in Libya. 
could is is could his life also be uh, uh, threatened? And if that were to happen, what what does that uh, leave us uh, with? And I want you also to weigh in on the. Uh, Saudi UAE openness, eh, not too much openness, but you know they they engaged uh, Muqtada uh, Sadr. What does it mean uh, for Iraq? Is it reconstruction money? Is it political backing? Uh, I'll start with the second. Uh, I'm as skeptical as Michael on the Saudi outreach. Uh, it does show one thing, though. By Saudi standards, it is changing one's leopard spots because the Saudis and I have had conversations with the top leadership in through two reigns in Saudi Arabia uh, their tendency is all Shia are fronts for Iran whether they know it or not so therefore we have a clear position uh, opposing a Shia is opposing Iran uh, they have moved away from that with Muqtada and to a certain degree Abadi as well and that shows a de an increasing degree of sophistication in trying to use um, Shia parties and to focus on Iran. The, the alternative is uh, uh, Recep uh, Tayyip Erdogan, who's nobody's pal here in Washington, but still, uh, Erdogan's opposition to Iran is always portrayed as against Persian expansionism. It's never in religious terms. If the Saudis can get to that point through steps like Muqtada and such, this would be a different and uh, for U.S. interests, better Middle East. In terms of Saudi being worried, you bet he's worried about his security. He always was worried about his security. And that has led to him when he was afraid we would uh, be the, uh, uh, ra the, the cause of his demise. He fled to uh, uh, Iran in 2004. Uh, sure, and then he begged and pleaded for Sistani to give him guarantees uh, when uh, uh, he was occupying the Golden Mosque and had to get out of there. Uh, he wasn't physically in there, of course, because, again, he's afraid of his own safety, but he was to the north. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add uh, two points to what was just discussed. Uh, about engaging uh, with Muqtada Sada, I don't think there needs to be uh, necessarily a high-profile meeting between uh, Muqtada and um, Pompeo or other U US for, uh, official, uh, because Muqtada has, even during the peak of tension between uh, his forces and U.S., he has at times reached out to the U.S. In 2007, I think he sent a letter. Uh, at least that was mentioned in WikiLeaks. Yeah. That he would not meet with us. Uh, we were trying no, to he, he wouldn't meet, but I, I think that U.S. can still, for now, in, uh, can engage Muqtada Sada in back-channel talks. We engaged him significantly. Yeah, and the U.S. has done it. 2004, 2005. Yeah, the, the, through the, Talibani. Yeah, the issue is that yeah. No, we did it directly. I did it directly with the number two. Yeah, because there are no just easy choices right now. There are no pro-American coalition that I can see in Iraq that could form, uh, could be formed. And secondly, about the Muqtada al-Sadr coalition, uh, I agree with Ambassador that uh, um, it's not like Hezbollah, but it is still the most cohesive religious and social movement. Uh, and its ability to mobilize the voters that itself <laughs> showed up. But as a political group, uh, I think, or a political coalition, Muqtada's coalition still remains very much fractious. Mm -hmm. uh, it can just fall apart. And, mm -hmm. and if you read the Iranian discussions uh, recently uh, about uh, the different scenarios in Iraq, uh, one uh, course of action is that perhaps Iran should try to uh, split the uh, Saudi coalition to try to woo some of those elements uh, within uh, Shiite elements and even Sunnis within the Sadr coalition that could come to a broader coalition that should include Prime Minister Abadi and Fatah and uh, the Kurds and others. Uh, so again, I'm not sure that uh, the Sadr coalition as a political coalition will necessarily just remain united in the future. No, I just wanted to say a couple things. Uh, to, to Bilal's point about the KDP and to the ambassador's point, uh, the KDP, again, uh, after this, didn't go apologize to Baghdad. They went to, to Tehran, like you said. They're looking for the strongest tribe. And my, my, my travels, my most recent travels to Iraq was in uh, November of 2017. And I even sat down with Sunni, Sunni leaders from the, from the former Sons of Iraq and the Awakening, and, and from, from Fallujah, from Ramadi, and, and from Mosul, 
uh, and ask the, them, is there a revenge factor? Do you, who are you looking to now? And they said the same thing. They're just going to start looking towards Russia because the U.S. isn't doing anything, and Iran is one, so we'll have to work with Iran now. They are the strongest tribe. So there's a default respect uh, element to this whole thing. When you win, you win. And in this case, I think uh, as we look to form that, that, that body of Kurds that you talked about, McGurk is, is go, trying to put together, Soleimani's trying to put that together too, but not to go towards the Abadi side, but to go towards the Maliki and uh, the Hadi al Amri side. Again, uh, Maliki punished the Kurds way back in 14. Abadi did it last year. So there's, there's who, do you, who do you dislike more based on the most recent mm -hmm. events? Uh, so there's there's a lot of things at play here. It's going to be so interesting as as we pull things away. And Ambassador, what was your ask in 2005 when you when you when you talked to Sadr second? Uh, the ask was to participate in the uh, political process. What was the answer? The answer was uh, in 2005 they didn't really, but they did in 2000. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about 2006, but they certainly did in 2010. They got 40 seats. Right, and that was after the jam ceasefire, after the charge of the knights, after uh, Sadr actually moderated his party. He promised a brigade and then, and then the others. But uh, it, it'd be a very interesting time. And, I, and to your point about, you're right, it doesn't need to be a high-level meeting, just some sort of ask or some sort of request of Sadr to do things. Um, I, I, I want Sadr not to be Sadr. And what I mean by that is Sadr to be this, this, this new... Uh, political, politically smart leader. Again, Sadr, you can say he is the one of the few Iraqi nationalists in that country. But, like you said, Ambassador, that Qasem Soleimani has never been to break the Najaf and break the, the Sistani uh, Marjaiya or, or break uh, the Sadrist movement. He's been able to marginalize them, mm -hmm. taking advantage of the fact that Sistani is a quietist and that Sadr, you know, when Sadr makes a lot of noise, Sadr goes to Tehran, and then Sadr disappears for a year. He's still in Iraq, but he, he goes away. And what's interesting, in 2007, when we were trying to engage with Sadr, we had to hide from his followers the fact that he was under house arrest in Iran because Iran wanted him to actually get certified, to go through the religious studies in order to be a cleric mm -hmm. so that he could actually have some leverage on him. So I would just put it out there that if there is a dossier that can ruin a political career, it's the one that Qasem Soleimani holds on Sadr. Uh, there was a very interesting exchange where Sadr uh, had a, uh, a do you know who I am moment in Iran, and the answer was get out and walk. And he walked for four miles and they went back and picked him up and uh, put him back in the car. We hid that from his followers because we were trying to use that as a nugget to try to get in and have some sort of engagement with Sadr to make more asks, the uh, stop bombing the... Uh, Stop using IEDs and AFPs against American soldiers, explosively formed penetrators and improvised explosive devices, and stop rocketing the IZ. And uh, of course, that's when we had the, the jam ceasefire after the charge of nights, but I'll leave it there. Bila? Um, I'll just probably add to this conversation. Uh, Mike ended, but uh, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey as well. Uh, Ambassador Jeffrey mentioned how uh, there are two not so pro-Iran, if in, even if not anti-Iran forces, and that's Sadr and the Marja'iyah. I would add a third element to that, and that's the question of oil, where Iraq and Iran are actually competitors. Mm -hmm. They're both members of OPEC, uh, and therefore they're both fighting for market share. Uh, and, and that's an area where Iran and Iraq you know, cannot see to eye to eye, uh, eye to eye because they are competitors. Uh, and that's an area where, uh, you know, an entry point for, for, uh, uh, for the United States. But let's not forget one other point here, is that this election, one of the outcomes of this election, is um, a very low turnout, even by Iraqi standards. We had 83 in 2005, and then 60 in 2010, and 2014, and this time it's 45, or 46. And that low turnout is because the Iraqi electorate does not trust this government to deliver what the people want. And again, if you look at polling data, what the people want are a few, the priorities are A, security, B, uh, jobs. Uh, the Iraq has one of the um, highest um, uh, young populations as a percentage of the general population. And the Iraqi government, the Iraqi economy is still a state-run economy, and they simply plateaued on their ability of creating even these ineffective and productive jobs. 
uh, and this, is, this applies to the KRG as well. And then third, fighting corruption. And corruption, again, is a, is a truly Iraqi phenomenon. It's, it's true in, in Basra, it's true in Erbil, it's true in Baghdad. That's, that's one thing that unites the Iraqi electorate. But, but this was Muqtada's platform. That was Muqtada's platform. But even there, as Mike mentioned earlier, uh, they didn't see a, a clear plan. Yes, this is the guy who hates corruption, but he does, did not come up with a the platform with a, an agenda of how he's going to fight corruption. It's not just enough to get rid of bad apples because, you know, if the, you know, basically they say uh, you stand depends on where you sit. And if you don't change the rules of the game, as I mentioned earlier, this patronage system, this, you know, everyone is in it, therefore it's government of everyone and therefore a government of no one, mm. um, then that's not going to, uh, just by changing parties or faces, that's not going to change the dynamic. A final point here is, so Iran is not able to deliver on anti-corruption. Iran is not going to be able to deliver on creating jobs and, and reforming the Iraqi economy or um, uh, you know, providing for better services, which has the Iraqi demands. Then why is Iran still so influential? I think it goes back to a fundamental flaw in the Iraqi uh, democracy and the Iraqi electoral system. And that was a decision that was made by the Iraqi uh, Constitutional Court in 2010 in which um, the court decided that it's not the winner of the election that forms the government. It's the largest bloc in the parliament. So in a way, rendering whoever wins the election moot. I mean, again, this started with, with Alawi winning 92 seats in 2010, and then Maliki asking the Supreme Court that gave it a, a decision that was in Maliki's favor, and therefore he created the, the largest coalition in, in the parlement. But, but so in a way, it doesn't matter who in wins. In parliamentary systems, I mean, you have the same in, in Lebanon, you have uh, the same in, uh, in France. I mean, this is not, but you're still democratic because, you know, the winner of the election, if now it's Sadr, 54 seats, but 54 seats in a confessional democracy is not e enough and shouldn't give you the. Uh, but there's a caveat here. Who gets the chance to. A coalition. The, the first chance at forming the government? The coalition does. It's a parliamentarian. Thank you very much. I've been waiting six years. No, I mean, this is, I don't understand six it. Years for somebody to defend the decision of the Iraqi Constitutional Court, even though, and I know all the personalities involved, I don't think it was a completely um, unpressured decision. It is the way that most democracies work, particularly in Iraq, even in the, first of all, the idea of winning elections. I didn't like even when Iyad Alawi got 91 seats to Maliki's 89 and talked about winning it. He got 27 or 26 percent of the vote and without winning. Nobody wins an Iraqi election. The point is forming a coalition requires a majority of seats in the Iraqi parliament and any other. It is a perfectly reasonable thing to say whichever coalition has the most seats gets the first chance to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was true in 2010. As I said, I think the motives for that decision were not entirely good constitutional principles, but it was a perfectly reasonable decision. And this idea, and I've heard this many times, but it is on such a long list of all the things America should have done to intervene in the internal relations of a country. One was we should, should have, you know, Ray Odeno should have marched the first time a division into Baghdad and annulled that decision. Huh? <laughs> But, but Jim, I think my, my point here is whether that's constitutionally legal or not. It is constitutionally legal. Okay, constitutionally but regardless of that, uh, it creates an opportunity for Iran, therefore, to you know, be the expert at being the mediator between creating that largest coalition in, right. uh, in the parliament, that's A, and B, therefore, this whole concept of democratic mandate will also be moot. So even if, if yeah, Southern no, wins... I, I, it creates opportunity for Iran, but it's perfectly democratic. It's, it's perfectly democratic for coalitions to come in the parliament and say, we are the majority and we are going to go Yeah, but the this, two are not uh, mutually exclusive. Just if I, if but I, no, I, I want to move to, because we're running really short on time. I'll okay. come back to you, Ahmed. We started a little late, so we can go over seven minutes. It's, it's fine. Yeah, uh, we haven't talked about Daesh, about ISIS at all. Because right. uh, they're defeated. They no longer yeah, exist. Nobody in, nobody, nobody in the region, done. except Brett and CENTCOM, have talked about Daesh for the last 18 months. Okay? But Do we have to talk about Daesh? We have to talk about Daesh, because I have a question for you all. I don't know who, who wants to take this. In, I volunteer, Jim. 
In, in the dynamic, let's say uh, <laughs> Iran wants to pressure, Iran wants to push, Iranian proxies want to pressure armed proxies. Uh, how much the, the, the force of uh, Daesh could, could be in, in Iranian uh, calculus? Uh, the fact that, yes, it is de defeated on the ground at lost territory, but it's still uh, an Reactive. insurgency. So right. how does that factor into Iranian uh, calculus? I'd like to take that one if that's OK, Ambassador, and then I'll pass back to you. So ISIS is not defeated. It simply lost territory. We destroyed Fallujah twice, 04 and 05, and never claimed victory over al-Qaeda. In this campaign, every time we've destroyed a city, we've claimed ISIS is defeated when it simply has moved into the al-Qaeda model. It exists, and it actually helps the Iranian argument here, the Qasem Soleimani argument. It, there will be opportunities in the next 90 days where certain coalitions will blame other coalitions for security backslide, which is when areas that have been liberated by ISIS now start to have ISIS attacks. We've already heard that from Maliki when he criticized a body when Ramadi was lost. We've already heard uh, Hadi <coughs> Al-Amri Al and Mohenda say, listen, we could leave Kirkuk and let it fall back into a uh, security mm -hmm. backslide. So th security backslide in, in the presence of ISIS is actually a leverage point for a lot of these parties. Remember, Maliki used the threat of Al-Qaeda to, to put in martial law in order to shape this coalition that everyone's talking about as part of this Democrat process, where it didn't matter who, who won initially with Alawi's uh, percentage, it mattered what coalition was formed afterwards that was able to go in. And again, elections don't determine democracies. Rule of law does. Transparency, institutions that counter corruption. And I, I'm a gringo, OK? I'm sorry, my Iraqi friends, and I'm always saying, what do you know about Iraq? Anyway. Um, I know the Iraqis do not believe there's rule of law, transparency, or institutions that are fighting corruption in Iraq. And that's why in every political party's uh, platform is fight corruption, put in institutions, be more transparent in, in these patronage systems. Uh, ISIS is alive and well. Uh, th the thing that, that's different from the United States is ISIS and Iran see Iraq and Syria as one battlefield. The IRGC militias in Iraq are in Syria. They've, they've dipped their toes in Lebanon. They've dipped their toes in Jordan. Uh, they see it as one battlefield, but they need ISIS to exist. They need the threat of security backslide, not only in Syria, but in northern Iraq, to make the argument that this is why we're here, this is why we're better at this than you are, and that coalition is counting on sticking around. The argument after the surge was, after al-Qaeda is defeated, the militias will simply go away. They didn't go away. They grew that more, more developed, more were uh, brought under the wing of Qasem Soleimani. And in, that, in that sense, ISIS is correct. Uh, one, one point on uh, this issue of, OK, how do you manipulate or influence the formation of a government? Uh, and uh, I mean, I worry about that, too, because essentially we want to do sex machina, which is whoever gets the most votes to somehow those guys get to rule so that we don't have to compete with the Iranians because we can't compete with the Iranians. And this gets to the core thing, and it be, goes beyond uh, Iran being next door. I don't know if anybody, to shift to North Korea, there was an article on um, Pompeo's meetings with uh, uh, Kim Jong-un. And they were talking about the guy he had with him, uh, a CIA guy who was born in North Korea, went to school in South Korea with the uh, current head of the Korean intelligence agency and is a second cousin of the Korean National Security Advisor. I think if somebody gave Qasem Soleimani that act, he'd say, wow. my God, the Americans know how to do that? Right, right. This sounds like me and my guys in Iraq. And the reason is Korea is existentially important for us, and we have made huge commitments to it, and it has actually been a investment that has paid off since 1950. Iraq, even though if you're here today, you like us, you care a lot about Iraq, that's not the same thing. We do not have the same skill sets. The Iraq Iranians care, as you know, really deeply about Iraq. But by the same token, they have a second tool. They will wreak havoc on anybody who gets in their way. They will use whatever mm. tools, because their only principle is we want to call the shots that, we, that matter in Iraq. Our basic principle is we want a unified, democratic, federal, democratic Iraq. Da, 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 da. 
uh, for example, it's hard to do now because of what happened with the independence referendum, but Bilal and I have talked about this often. Would we have actually had a quiet meeting with Abadi and Maliki and maybe with the Iranians and said, you get a deal. We get a neutral Finland Iraq as a whole that doesn't threaten you but also doesn't threaten us the way Lebanon threatens uh, Israel. Or bye bye Kurdistan. Because we just talked to Erdogan and his troops are staying on and those oil lines are going to stay open and the American Air Force and Special Forces are going to stay there. And we don't care what that does to a unified and democratic Iraq. That's the deal if you don't play ball with us. Does anybody in this audience think we would ever have played that game? I don't. We couldn't. We would go against our mindset. The Iranians know how to play that game in Iraq, and that's why it is so difficult to beat them. I'm willing to have our government try, but it is very difficult in practical terms to fight people who will use those tools and who have those uh, insights into how that uh, society ticks. To the ambassador's point, the graphic that you see now are, are those tools that, that Iran can use to wreak havoc on Iraq, and they're also doing the same in, in Syria, just for context, as you see that up there. Just two quick ones, yeah. Uh, uh, first, to what, what Bilal mentioned um, about the uh, system of voting um, in Iraq. I think that uh, even if it was a winner-take-all system or that constitutional provision did not exist, it's not, I think, still for certain that uh, Iran would not have its wish uh, in the Iraqi politics. Because remember that just before the elections, there was a very temporary, of course, a coalition between Prime Minister Abadi, the Fatah Alliance, and also Hikmah That's right. with them. Uh, and all these groups, uh, uh, well, Abadi is somehow centrist in the middle, but Hikmah and Fatah Alliance is very much close to Iran. So Iran could have still put uh, together a coalition that uh, ser could serve its interest. And then uh, that coalition, of course, fell apart quickly because Sadr uh, complained about it, and also there was a disagreement over distribution of power. And then they all agreed that, OK, we will leave the coalition building to the post-election time. And second, about the ISIS issue, um, I think that one reason that today we are talking about Iraq, despite the massive sacrifice that the US has had uh, in the country and but does not have a lot of leverage, and even to a lesser extent in Syria, for example, is that uh, the Obama administration, and also the same way the Trump administration followed by it, uh, their uh, policy there has been ISIS-centric. It has been counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. So although it has been able to deal with the symptom of the problem, uh, that uh, they claim ISIS is militarily defeated, although you have rightly pointed out that, yeah, the ideology is there. They are still there. They're sleeper. Uh, but the underlying causes are still there. So uh, we may have to deal with ISIS 2.2 or 2.3, whatever you call it, just the next day. So th that's why it's important. I think that I'm just making a very broad general statement. but. It's important that uh, the U.S. needs to have a long-term strategy uh, for, for Iraq. One reason that the Iranians are effective, among so many others, is that they've always had this long-term view about Iraq. But the U.S. Uh, always changes every four years or sometimes every year. So that needs to change. Unless the U.S. has an uh, enduring commitment to the Iraqi stability uh, for strengthening the Iraqi institutions, sidelining the malign actors, and particularly those uh, militia groups, that have been responsible for sectarianism and terrorism in Iraq. Uh, I think that just the problems that uh, the US has in the region will continue to persist. To, to both of your points, I mean, the, the argument to stay, the ambassador says that Erdogan's able to do things like this, Iran is as well. Uh, Votel used this argument when he testified. He said, we're in Syria because we are trying to defeat ISIS and we're trying to maintain the security of Iraq. Uh, we can almost use that argument to stay in Iraq as well. ISIS is not defeated, mm -hmm. we should stay. If this government on the right forms, to my right, the, the one that Qasem Soleimani wants, we, we have to stay in some capacity. Because again, ISIS isn't defeated. And the last time we left, in 2011, ISIS rose. Uh, we should. Wait, wait, if, the, if Qasem Soleimani wins and we get this pro-Iranian government, yep. that's a bigger reason for us to stay. Yes, yes, that's my, that's my argument. I, I, I'm almost, uh, i got like 30 more seconds. It's going to make complete sense. Um, <laughs> so, so what we do is, you know, listen, we have a U.S. training and equip program. We have three, three goals. You mentioned them. Keep the oil flowing, be able to target ISIS, 
be able to keep existential threats from reemerging from this area. Again, in 2011, Al-Qaeda was decimated. Al-Qaeda was defeated. It morphed into ISIS. If we leave now, when ISIS isn't defeated, it is already in the Al-Qaeda model, then we literally have to send 10-year-old Americans back as 20-year-olds to fight again. Uh, wh why do we have to do that? Why, why is it our job to, I mean, as a guy who spent as much time as anybody yeah. in this town fighting these guys in faraway places, why do we have to fight ISIS? Because they become... Why, why, don't, why don't we let... No, because they're going to come here. Existential threats. Uh, well, look, ISIS has been around since 2014. I can think of one significant attack, San Bernardino, maybe 1% of all Americans killed by gunfire in America in the last few years that we can attribute to them. That's so existential to justify hundreds of thousands of American troops. My argument in your scenario is, uh, and I know we would never accept this, but I'm right. just trying to show how a cold-blooded policy would work. Let the Iranians and ISIS fight it out. Let them fight it out in Iraq so that they cannot... We tried that in Syria, saying, let Hezbollah fight Jabhat al-Nusra, and it morphed into ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra. It morphed into other groups. It morphed, morphed into Iraqi Shia militias going to Syria. We, are, we tried to let Iran hey, right. fight it out, and it didn't work. How so, about a regional force? I mean, that's, uh, no, that's, that's the argument. That's, that's, that's a good counter-argument, but Thank still... Yeah. Uh, Respectful. Counter right, we, we fought ISIS because of two reasons. One is we were really afraid of the impact it would have on Europe. Yes. The European allies asked us, particularly after the Paris attacks, because up until the November of 2015, let's face it, Obama's heart right. was not in the fight. It was after then. The second thing is we fought ISIS because Iraq was so important to us. Right. But if Iraq doesn't become important to us, I don't see the need for us to fight ISIS. And I think in terms of the Paris attacks, uh, Obama, uh, rather not Obama, Trump would say, right. tell me how many troops uh, our, uh, our NATO European allies have, right, right. how many aircraft, and how many forces do we have fighting ISIS? They could have done that if they wanted to. Right, right. They we, could have. we could end two weeks in Mosul. But the thing is, it's not just ISIS that we'd be fighting now. We're also going to be fighting these IRGC Quds Force militias. The, the extension of the Quds Force through Iraq. So that's the argument. That's the Iran policy that you were asking for, Ahmed. When Secretary Pompeo says we now have an Iran strategy, what well, it has to be, he said, we're going to stop Qasem Soleimani, crush Qasem Soleimani, do these things. Uh, you have to start in these places. Uh, the, the Iraq and the northern Middle East cannot continue to incubate these existential threats. And not, now they won't only be Sunni threats. There will now be Shia Islamist threats, state-sponsored Shia terrorist groups, which is, which is different than ISIS. It never had a state sponsor. No, I, I agree with you. Sure. We have 18 minutes. Uh, we're going to go to some Q&A. Uh, I think we'll take uh, three questions at a time, come back to the panel, and then yeah, take more. So let's start with the gentleman. Agdur, please wait for the mic and identify yourself. Thank you very much, Rahman Jubari with National Endowment for Democracy. Thanks for the heating discussion. I just want to put three other options on the table. Mike, uh, your chart is good. But Abadi is the weakest in the first chart. Actually, yes. there is brewing another coalition right now, which is Abadi out of it. What lead the Shia right now is Al Hikma and Muqtada. So Muqtada, Al Hikma, Ayad Alawi, Barazani mm -hmm. is brewing a coalition right now. Mm -hmm. Yes. We are meeting. I just talked to them. That's probably. And the reason Abadi insists to be prime minister. Al Hikma and the Sadr, well, they wanted an option, not just Al Abadi, the Prime Minister. Second, on the uh, Soleimani came a lot of time here. Mm. It, Soleimani in this one is a smoking screen for the Iranian. It is run by Khamenei himself. He has a representative sitting with the Amri in his office right now. So don't in Washington get fooled by Soleimani is moving around. And, and the third one, basically, is talking to Muqtada and how do you talk to him? Muqtada and Al-Hakim divided the, the negotiation. Al-Muqtada will talk to the Arab region, to the others. Al-Hakim is the one in charge of talking for the international. You know, the American met on, with Al-Hakim twice. One of them is on, he was meeting with them on behalf of the Sadr. Mm -hmm. so, Go to the Hakim to, to, to talk to Assadr. Don't try to get to Assadr direct. Thanks. Question? Oh, no question. Okay. 
Yeah, this is a living, a living document, so we'll change it around as it goes. But thank this you for that. This changes. Those if you follow Mike on Twitter, this changes every five tweets. So uh, <laughs> we're going to go to the good way. here. <laughs> Very good way. I like this one much uh, better than you. Dear Harp Intel Analyst and once the uh, Iraq Analyst at State Department. <clears throat> I would posit, sir, that uh, anybody who rapes little girls in the name of Allah is a national, international threat, and that every country has a responsibility to crush it militarily, including the U.S. And if the U.S. is the only one willing to do it, then the U.S. does it. Um, the question is uh, that um, Sistani is not particularly obeisant to Veliati Faki, and as such, it seems he might tend to lean toward the newly nationalist Al Sadr uh, brand. And um, despite the fact that Sadrist ran torture chambers within the holiest mosques uh, in Iraq, uh, is that true? And does um, Sistani have, in fact, any influence? Uh, Sabrosa in uh, forming these coalitions, and is he a quiet kingmaker of any sort? Okay, we're gonna go here and then. <laughs> yes, I, uh, Paul Davis, uh, Vice Jeffrey, I'd like to thank you because you're the only person here that used the term Kurdistan. So my question is, is to you and to anybody else who would like to answer it. Based on the uh, outcome of the elections and the fact that it is very, very heavily a Shia, uh, potentially pro-Iranian, and this, everybody on the panel has said there is no uh, avenue uh, to get to a, uh, a pro-American government. How do you see this, the outcome of these elections affecting the, uh, the one Iraq policy? And would there be a potential for Iraq to begin the process of breaking apart? Okay, uh, how do you want to... Uh, I'll start. Bang. Uh, I think that Iraq is going to stay unified, uh, in part because you don't have a Kurdistan policy, if I can use that word, uh, without Turkey. And right now, believe me, you, the Kurds do not have Recep Tayyip Erdogan beyond the uh, uh, fuel flowing. Uh, <laughs> in terms of Sistani, uh, it, it gets to both the last two questions of how you put together these coalitions. Uh, the, the coalition the first gentleman asked is very similar to the coalition we tried to put together in 2010. It just didn't have enough Shia in it, partially because we didn't want Muqtadar around. We didn't want anything to do with him. Now, if we're willing to have a different attitude towards Muqtadar, there's a uh, theoretical possibility for that coalition to get some kind of American and thus Arab world blessing. In terms of uh, Sistani, you would think so. By the way, yeah, uh, Sada did run uh, torture uh, uh, courts inside uh, Najaf during the 2004 fighting. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, the whole Sistani, Hakim, uh, Sada thing, again, I'm not an expert, but every time we got into that, you run into certain issues among Iraqi Shia Islam. The two greatest families are the Hakims and the Sadrs. And the third party is Sistani because of his own great credibility and the fact of the position he holds. So those are three somewhat separate power centers within this orbit of non-Iranian Shia Iraqi Islam. And how they fit together or don't fit together has been a mystery to us and I think a mystery even to most Iraqis, including members of the Sadr family and the Hakim family that I've talked to over the years. So it's really hard to build a U.S. policy based upon some theoretical coalition among them. Uh, Can I just add quickly something? Quickly, yes. Yeah. Uh, on the coalition, uh, I, I wouldn't run any other coalition uh, that because this process will just drag on for months. Uh, these coalitions that you're talking about, that will keep changing. Uh, there is possibility that uh, Muqtada al-Sadr's coalition just fractures. There is even possibility that uh, Hadi Amiri uh, will leave the Fatah Alliance and join the Badr organization. Uh, and although I think that other panelists may not agree, I even see a body emerge as a consensus candidate uh, to just lead a new coalition to be, uh, for, for a sec uh, second term. And about Sistani, let's just remember that uh, in addition to all the good reasons that Bilal mentioned, that why people didn't 
uh, turn to vote, and that I think hurt Abadi most, yes. was also Sistani's uh, uh, announcement. It was not a fatwa, but yes. it was an announcement that he said that, well, if you are just not going to vote and if you decide to stay home, it's your choice because the politicians, they have failed. And those who have been tested should not be tested again. That uh, announcement had very different interpretations in Sadr Ba. Some interpreted it as like pro Sadr because Sadr has not been tested, so go and vote for him. But definitely it hurt a body. It even may have hurt uh, the Fatah Alliance candidates as well. But it uh, benefited uh, Muqtada al-Sadr. Uh, he may not have meant to uh, help Muqtada al-Sadr, but ultimately, ultimately it did. Do we have any names we are looking at that are not, you know, from the, the predictable list to be prime minister? Any uh, dark horses uh, out there that we don't know about? Maybe a governor of a province or someone else that could emerge? It's usually what happens. Maliki was a consensus candidate nobody saw coming, and the body was a consensus candidate. So we could likely see somebody, we you know, Abid, Abid, Abid Mehdi, what's his name? Uh, Abdul Abdul Mehdi, he's a, uh, yeah, he could possibly rise. There could be somebody that's a compromise candidate. And again, uh, Abadi's been touted as our guy in Baghdad, and Qasem Soleimani has, al al has always said that Abadi gives us the United States. Mm. And it, so it, we could see somebody. Okay. Oh, we can go to, to 12, uh, 137 because we started seven minutes late. So we have seven minutes, then, unless you have yeah. to run. No, I'm here. Okay. Uh, I could run if you want me to, but yeah. No, no, no. Thank you. Um, Karwan Zavari with the KRG. Can I, can I ask all of your views as to what the regional reaction has been with respect to the results that came out? And I mean specifically Turkey, Jordan, Gulf countries, Israel. How do they see this? Is, is Iraq a lost cause for them? Uh, I've, I've, I've spoken to some Sunni regional allies, uh, some of the members from the, for the, from the embassies here in D.C., and they ask, is Sadr this guy now? Has Sadr changed his stripes or changed his spots? And I say every time that he's been controversial, he's gone to Tehran and he's come back and disappeared for a year. But he could change. But the biggest concern is is about Sadr. And the most interesting thing is all of all of these Sunni regional allies were on the Abadi camp, and now they're on the Sadr camp. And I'm I'm I, I, it leads me to believe that no matter who would have won the election, there would be the same sort of spin, this narrative, uh, that you know I've I've heard this from people in D.C. You know, Case Kazali is really not that bad. This is the guy who went to the Lebanese border. Yes. Yeah, Case Kazali. Yes. And, and, you know, Hadi Alamri could be a good prime minister. And you've already, these are floating the narratives out there to see what will stick. So those are the questions. Is, who is Sadr? Is he who we hope he is? Or is he Joe Pesci and Goodfellas? You know, the guy who always thinks he's going to get made and then ends up getting marginalized in the end. I don't know. Yeah, Tur Turkey is interesting because next to Iran and uh, the U.S. Turkey is by far the most influential and the most in interested in uh, Iraq of all of the other countries literally in the world. Uh, but uh, uh, two things. First of all, uh, Erdogan is totally tied up in his electoral campaign and secondarily in Syria. Secondly, the Turks don't really have a uh, Iraq policy without having a uh, healthy Kurdish policy as part of it, not all of it, but part of it. And they can't have, Erdogan can't have a healthy Kurdistan policy right now because his electoral partner, the MHP party, uh, is extremely anti Kurdish of all colors, not just the PKK, but also the KDP, the PUK, you name it. And thus, uh, Erdogan is trying to stay out of this thing until he gets through his June 24th elections. Then we'll see. And, and, and the reaction in Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates was cautious optimism. Because if you saw the tweet from uh, the Saudi uh, Minister Emerson. for Gulf Affairs, yeah, uh, he welcomed Sadr's victory. And he hoped that that would open a new chapter in the Iraqi politics that could strengthen Iraq's sovereignty and also Arab identity, which was, of course, <coughs> uh, uh, a reference to Iran. Uh, but, but they still uh, want to see that what, what course of action Sadr just would take, uh, whether he would just stick to this 
nationalism or he would just make some deal with Iran. So there is uncertainty regarding that too. But in addition to Iraq, uh, what the Saudis and others hoped is that this uh, Shiite nationalism that uh, Saudi is championing and won the elections on it, on that platform, that would reverberate uh, uh, in the Shiite communities across the region. So similar just movements uh, could challenge uh, just I I Iranian influence in their respective countries. Which hasn't, it hasn't happened in the Lebanese elections, despite some efforts to have yeah. moderates uh, challenge Hezbollah. Hezbollah, uh, you know, increased its. Uh, but Hezbollah dominates the uh, Lebanese Shiite community. But in Iraq, there is a lot of diversity, right. and also Lebanon has not had those kind of strong marjiyas that could, in a re uh, religiously, could challenge uh, Iran's claim to be the leader of uh, the Shiite world. That's a very good point. We're going to go here and there. Alexander Kravitz from Insight. Thank you for a very interesting panel, as, as always. Two questions. I wanted to pick up on something you said at the beginning. You mentioned the irregularities in the election. And uh, there have been some allegations of fraud, in particular in the, in, in the Kurdish region. And, and it didn't come up at all in the discussion. So I, I'd, I'd like to hear. <coughs> is it just sour grapes of you know sort of losers, or are they serious allegations? If so, how serious? If if you'd comment about that, and um, since you you mentioned that you know you do this again in June and July, I would just like to put all of you on the spot, and you said to see how well you've done or not. I'd like to put you all on the spot, and if you could just pick, uh, you know your your number one uh, prediction of who's going to be the the prime minister A and B. How long will the government formation take? And then we can have some fun in June. You stole my conclusion. <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll let you answer that. And we're going to take the question there, and then we're going to come to answers. Yeah, my name is uh, David Copley. I'm a city <laughs> officer. I just wanted to get the panel's thoughts on if we do end up with a nationalist-oriented coalition, what do you think the end state looks like for the PMF, and how integrated will they be into the Iraqi security forces? Okay, yeah. so let's start okay, with the, the fraud tradition. question. Yeah. Um, yes, the allegations of fraud are serious. Um, uh, this time around, instead of manual uh, counting, they used um, uh, electronic um, counting. And uh, you, you know, the Iraqi government spent, uh, I think, $130 million uh, to buy equipment from a Korean company. Um, so there were some irregularities as to whether they worked, whether they properly worked and functioned, but mainly in uh, five provinces, Ambar, uh, Kirkuk, actually six, so Ambar, Nineveh, uh, and then all of uh, Kurdistan region uh, provinces, uh, mainly in, in Sulaymaniyya, uh, there are serious allegations of fraud. Yes, there is an element of sour grapes, as you mentioned. Some political parties did not do as well as um, they hoped or as the polls uh, showed before. But the reason why there's a shock in the KRG is it's very difficult for, for the opposition parties to stomach how these political parties, despite the major blunders that they had, which is still very fresh in people's memory, I'm talking about the referendum and the aftermath, uh, they could still not lose, but actually win more seats. That, that was one part. And then there's also evidence that's mounting. Uh, for example, um, in the, uh, one of the commissioners uh, of, the, of the IHEC, of the Independent Higher Electoral Commission, uh, has shown data uh, showing how, uh, not to get into the details, but for example, there were machines and there were backup machines. So the uh, main machines were rigged in, order, in, in a way to uh, favor the, the ruling party. And then when that machine failed and they used the backup party that was not rigged, then the elections came uh, very differently from, um, uh, from the norm, from the trend. Um, there are also allegations of uh, candidates themselves going into a polling station and voting for themselves and then having a zero vote in that polling station. And there are at least you know, nine or 10 members of parliament who basically say that I got zero in my own polling station. So this, um, um, and of course, this was exacerbated by the night of the election, uh, some forces in Sulaymaniyya attacking the headquarters of the main opposition party with heavy machine guns while the leadership was actually meeting to discuss the electoral uh, election results. So in a way, uh, this is very smelly. And uh, I think the evidence is mounting to a degree that uh, the United Nations is now on board and asking for the possibility of a 5% recount. 
in order to address those allegations. But obviously, it's not in the interest of IHEC, Baghdad, for that matter, the United States and Iran, to question the legitimacy of the election because it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, it's Pandora's box. Once you question the election in one spot, then that opens the door for everyone else to question the legitimacy. And obviously, both Iran and Washington want the conversation to move on and move forward toward uh, government formation. This is not an easy feat, as we have discussed. Uh, but those allegations are serious. And they're more serious, again, in the Kurdistan region because uh, the KRG is slated to have elections in September, regional elections. And we just had um, a series of protests. Some of them turned violent. So KRG, without addressing the question of legitimacy and power sharing uh, and the grievances of the opposition, is slated for an implosion, especially since um, mainly the PUK is going through a leaderless phase. And you have you know, rising warlordism, where people with guns and interests are trying to preserve uh, the privileges and perks and power. Um, even through using um, uh, force. And again, this incident that I talked about has so far you know, um, moved on with impunity. There has not been any investigation or any accountability against those uh, per uh, perpetrators. So KRG is slated for implosion unless these questions of, uh, of uh, vote rigging are, are addressed. And that's also a question for Iraq, how much of this re-engaging with Iraq is actually going to help stability in, um, in the KRG. Because if it doesn't, if IHEC doesn't do its, its role, for example, in, in making sure to properly investigate these allegation frauds, then this whole rapprochement and resetting of relations between KRG and Baghdad will basically um, um, face a blow. To answer your second question. Um, no, no, okay. let's leave the predictions to the end. No, 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 I'm answering oh, your question about okay. that. Uh, the Iraqi security forces, the PMUs. This is the Fatah party that you see on the wall. Um, the Sistani PMUs are not being integrated into the Iraqi security forces. These have been integrated into the Iraqi security forces. They're already in. If this becomes a party in opposition, an opposition party, meaning outside of government, if that formation takes place right here on your left, a correction, on my left here, um, they're, they are an opposition party. If they're in government, they will not only control the MOD and the MOI because they've already saturated it, they will make a grand bargain to keep Hadi al Amri as prime minister and, a correction, Haider al Abadi as prime minister in exchange for Ministry of Oil, Transportation, and Finance. And that will make them, some people disagree, but that would at least make, get me to recommend to Capitol Hill that OFAC and U.S. Treasury start putting secondary sanctions on Iraq's ministries where the IRGC is playing. And again, this is the IRGC Fatah party. Okay. Um, so we're going to then uh, end with predictions. Next time we meet, if uh, or you meet, if I'm invited back or not, uh, we'll, 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 back. Yes. we'll see um, what awaits in the green room. Uh, but uh, yeah, prediction. I mean, you know, three months <clears> from now, will we see a prime minister or will this be another 2010? So, Give me a name. So, so the president's going to want some sort of victory in Iraq. So I see Haider al Abadi as prime minister with all those concessions I just mentioned. Uh, we'll call it victory against ISIS, and our man in Baghdad has won in Iraq. All is well, and it won't be. Before our November 2018 elections. That's not a bad prediction, but I'd say uh, the most likely is an extended, extended. Uh, debate to try to form a coalition because there are enough people who don't want that to happen. And one of the reasons that after nine months we actually got a government in 2010 was because the U.S. government really needed one to try to figure out whether we were keeping troops on or not. The U.S. government will not be that engaged in doing that, uh, to, and it doesn't have the tools it had in 2010. So I would say most likely it's going to be an extended uh, uh, fight and nobody knows how it will turn out. If they do form a government, it will be more likely uh, a uh, government with, uh, I think, the one on your left with, um, which, which one do we call that? The uh, one with uh, Soleimani preferred one? Uh, no, the other one. I, I don't think the Soleimani preferred one has. Sadr Hickman. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that one has a chance. I think that it's either going to be a one uh, chaos, the usual pr good prediction with Iraq. Two. Uh, uh, it will be the uh, Sidrus-led coalition of the never Iranis, and only third will it be the uh, 
uh, it won't even it will never be the Soleimani led one it will be a grand coalition of everybody which will serve as you said Soleimani's uh, interests yeah I reserve the right to change my mind in 30 okay. days by the way <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll leave it to the expert to uh, predict who the next prime minister will be, but I think that um, it will be one of the two scenarios in Iraq. Uh, one would be a very weak uh, government uh, formed by a very weak coalition that may find it very difficult to sustain itself, or it could be a grand coalition uh, and which will try to find a consensus candidate. And that consensus candidate, I don't see him to be a polarizing figure like Hadi Amiri or um, Nur al-Maliki and others, uh, it would be somebody like Abadi or somebody from Hikma party. Okay. Uh, well, I'd like to end on a lighter note. My Thank vote, you, Ambassador. Thank you very much for coming. Um, my vote goes to uh, the chief political satirist in Iraq who is truly Iraqi by making jokes about everyone. It's Iraq's John Stewart, Ahmed al-Bashir. <laughs> nice. Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll see in three months, but, but that'll be yeah, a colorful pick. Yes. Uh, thank you all. See you in three months, maybe. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you. follow Mike on Twitter. <laughs> thank you, Mike.